Oh, man, this is a great day to be together in the house of the Lord. And um, Lou, our drummer, uh, just came, he gave me a hug. Like, he, we usually have a little tag off. And at the, after the 9 o'clock, he gave me this. That's a drumstick that he broke. At the 10.30, he gave me this because of what he uh, put into the drums. And so this time, he came to me like, ah, I love you guys, love you guys. <laughs> hey, let's give it up for the band. They always bring it, always bring it. Love you guys. You know, you just you show up. God is worthy, and we bring all of ourselves into his presence, and together we'll sense his lift. So I pray that today you will be feeling that lift as well, and not only in this house, but in your house, Christ Journey Online. Thank you for being a part of our extended family there. Um, but I still, I got to tell you, I wish you could feel the love in this room, and I know someday you will, you'll come, and you'll give me a hug, and then we'll celebrate together. So, especially, you know, on days like today, I want to start with your help. You got to help me out here. Let's bring this up on the screen if we can. Somebody said, life is easy. I want you to say this with me, everybody together, okay? Life is easy. All you have to do is put up with the intolerable, overcome the insurmountable, and accomplish the impossible. Some days feel like that, don't they? And I'll tell you what, sometimes marriage can feel like that. Especially when things don't go as you had hoped. You ever heard this? Murphy was an optimist. Do you know Murphy's Law? Do you know Murphy's Law? It says everything, anything that can go wrong will go wrong at the worst possible moment. And somebody put a bumper sticker together and it said, Murphy was an optimist. <laughs> You know, that's like dark humor trying to get a laugh when you're facing the absurd. Sometimes life seems painfully absurd. And marriage, marriage can be painful too. I mean, the vows say it, don't they? I mean, we say it right up there. You're standing in front of a preacher, you're saying the vows, here's what we say. Um, For better or worse, in richer or poorer, in joy or in sorrow, in sickness or in health, till death do us part. Oh my goodness, look right there. It's all there. Poverty, adversity, sorrow, sickness, and death. Look what you got in marriage. And <laughs> it's all woven into the fabric that we call marriage. Hard times will come. In fact, Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 said that hard times are going to come to every house. He said the rains will rise, will, the rains will come down, the streams will rise up, the winds will blow and beat against your house. Circumstances will come trying to beat you up. And so it is with love in the wild. These adventures in married land, sometimes those married adventures come with circumstances trying to beat you up. They will beat against your house, he said. And some houses fall, some don't. But I'm telling you, every house, every life, every marriage is going to meet hard times. This is love in the wild. So we've been learning from couples, from the Bible couples. Uh, what couple would be an appropriate teaching couple for us today in facing hard times. How about Mr. and Mrs. Job? It's hard to imagine in all the Bible a couple more experienced in, in heartache, hardship, adversity, calamity, tragedy, and misery than Mr. and Mrs. Job. If you have lost something at any point in your marriage, you've got something in common with them. If you've ever lost wealth, had an economic downturn, or a situation, a setback that has been an economic misfortune to you, then they did too. I mean, we love rags to riches stories, don't we? Theirs is a riches to rags story. 
And that's just the chapter one of their story. Theirs is the opposite. They go from riches to rags. Once they were a very affluent couple, they had fame, they had fortune, everybody knew who they were. They were at the top of the, of the mountain here, you know, everybody in the region. They were the toast of the territory, knew their reputation. They, uh, they were the greatest success story of their time, actually. And uh, they had thousands and thousands and thousands of animals in their herds, sheep, camel, oxen, donkeys. They've got it all. This is their story. And then in a single day, they lose everything. Raiders attack and steal the oxen and the donkeys. A fluke, massive lightning storm, it feels like, strikes where the sheep pens are and burns up all of their sheep, the story says. And then three groups of predator gangs that are thieving their way through the area charge in and make off with all of their camels. So now, in a single day, they're facing a huge loss. There's a loss of wealth. There's a loss of business. There's a loss of resource. There's a loss of future resource and wealth. No passive income coming their way. It's all gone. And that's not all. Mr. and Mrs. Job have a beautiful family. Seven sons, three daughters, And their families get along so well together. They always host big parties in their homes. And everybody likes to come over and be together and uh, share the good time. And yet, on the same day that Mr. and Mrs. Job learn of their economic woes, they get word that a uh, horrific desert windstorm has brought these storm force... uh, gusts into the area, the property where the, one of their sons, their, I guess it's their oldest son, yeah, um, has his home, and it literally blew out the pillars that were sustaining the house, and it collapses on everybody inside who was inside. All the brothers, all the sisters, all the family, they're all in there on the same day. None survive except the one that was bringing the message to mom and dad about what just happened. So there's a loss of material goods. There's a loss of family. I'm telling you, there's no grief like a couple's grief over losing a child, is there? Is this like the the worst possible grief? The, The weight of this most terrible grief comes crashing in and then crushing down on them. And, uh, that's just chapter one of the story of Job. Chapter two, Job breaks out with some kind of skin disease, some sort of mysterious, um, horrific pain-filled sores that are creating blisters all over his body. So he's in constant anguish, and the story says that he is now sitting, scraping those sores with a shard of broken pottery as he just sits in the ash heap of his suffering. He's lost all of his worldly goods. The sum of his past, everything he had worked for to that point, gone. He's lost all of his loved ones, his family, his children, This is loss of hope for the future, his past, his future. And now in the present, he's got this embarrassing, disgusting, painful disease that he can't hide from anybody. I mean, it's it's everywhere. And that's when his wife, Mrs. Job, says to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. The pain is too much. I mean, those can't have been easy words to hear. They weren't easy words to say either, right? You know the saying, hurt people, hurt people. This woman is hurting. I mean, she's been through, think about it, every trial, every tragedy, 
every heartache, every hardship. She's gone through it all, right with him, right by his side. Will the marriage last? Statistics tell us that even one of these type of experiences can blow a marriage up in our day. We don't know. Not in chapter 2. This is chapter two of the story. What we do know is that mama is ready for the suffering to end. I mean, better to die than to go on like this. Now, we don't know if she's saying it in a rage, curse God and die, or if she's saying it just in this kind of quiet, sorrowful despair, curse God and die. What we do know is that it seems that she is saying, even if it means God gets so upset with you that you die, then what have you got to lose? Maybe death is not such a bad option, considering where we are. You've heard of death by cop. What about death by God? I mean, she's hurting. She's low. And Job hears his wife saying that. Of course, he knows her. He's been with her for all these years. They've gone through so much together. He he knows that something's off here. He says to her, you're you're not thinking straight. This, This is not wisdom that you're speaking. Actually, the Hebrew word is crooked, that her thinking is off. It's not level. It's something is, is not right here. And, and then in a kind of gentle rebuke, at least that's how I hear him, he says, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Which is like, whoa, what kind of guy is this? You know? I mean, what, what kind of man is this? And... Uh, And we suddenly discover that this is a philosophical question. Job is a philosophical book. Job is one of the books of wisdom, which means it's about the whys of life, the, philo- the philosophical underpinnings of life. How, how Job, Job is one of the books of wisdom, a probing book that maybe is, asks the greatest question that any, any of us can ever face. Why do the innocent suffer? Why do bad things happen to good people? It's one of the, and good marriages and good families. Why? It, this is one of the most baffling mysteries of life. Job's book actually dates back to 2000 BC, the time of the earliest patriarchs, which means scholars say it's perhaps the oldest book of the Bible, which means that this question is one of the oldest questions that humans struggle to answer, isn't it? You probably faced it, haven't you? Every person, every marriage, every home will at some point be facing something that just doesn't square, something that feels off, something that doesn't make sense, it doesn't feel right, it doesn't seem fair, and you're going to find yourself saying, why? Why is this happening? What does seem clear is that the innocent are suffering. And you just want to know why. Jesus, the most innocent who ever lived, was on that cross saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knows this feeling. Now, Back to Job, Job's uh, so-called friends. They try to answer the question using the only filter that they're familiar with, which at the time uh, was this. It was a popular belief that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. And so good things come when you do good and bad things come when you do bad. And the problem with that is that Job, that's kind of a karma approach, you know, but Job made them mad by insisting that he, hey, I'd done nothing wrong. 
And the story says, he's, the Bible is very clear about this. He's an upright man. He shuns evil. He seeks to live his life doing the right thing at the right way at the right time for the right reason. You know, I mean, put me on the stand. Hook me up to the lie detector. I'm telling you, that's true. That's, that's me. That's how I live. And his friends don't believe it. They believe something else about him. They believe he must be hiding the truth. And so the story then also, that's a mystery, right? The story introduces us to another mystery. That Satan has an audience with God. And it actually says that God asks Satan, hey, have you seen my servant Job? What a guy. He fears God, he shuns evil, he's blameless, he's upright. Man, he's got it going on here. And Satan says, "Uh uh-huh. He wouldn't if he didn't have it so good all the time. And God lets Satan get at his possessions and at his family. Now, that's troubling to me. This is a part of the story that troubles me. And, uh, and God lets Satan go at him, and then Job the, says this, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. May the name of the Lord be praised. What kind of guy is this? What kind of man is this? Oh, he's the one who fears God above all. He shuns evil. He seeks to do what's right. And, and Satan said, well, he wouldn't. He wouldn't do that. If his flesh and bones were smitten in agony, he would curse you to your face. And so God says, try, but don't kill him. Now, that's troubling to me too, right? Right? But Satan unleashes the worst that he can bring. And after he does, that's when Mrs. Job says, curse God and die. And what does Job do? He says, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? And in all of this, Job does not sin in what he said. What kind of man is this? This is a good man. But if you're keeping score, I got the scoreboard on this. Here's what it said. God, two, Satan, zero. That's the status so far in the challenge. Now, in the final conversation of the book, we're going to fast forward all the way to the end of the book. In the final conversation, God speaks from the storm. We can't go into more today, but it's interesting here. When God speaks, he still doesn't answer the question, why? You know what he does? He answers the question, with a bigger how. He invites Job to step into the biggest how he could have in himself, in God. And essentially says, I am bigger than all the injustices. I am bigger than all the suffering. I am bigger than all of the conflicts. I am bigger than the... uh, the mysteries of, uh, of science behind the cosmos and how nature stirs. He invites Job into this conversation. The God who is not absent, though he has been silent, speaks seemingly and is present in our troubles. Now, those who study such things, historical philosophy They say that if you study the history of philosophy, what you'll discover, it's the ancient Hebrews who introduced this concept, the concept of divine mystery as a response to human suffering. The Hebrews. The existence of Satan is also part of that mystery, casting this shadow over the whole story, this diabolical, supernatural adversary. And we don't have time today to go into that as well. But I got to tell you, in our next series, I've already started working on it, Unmasking the Shadows, Who the Devil Is He? We're going to come back and spend some time understanding. We're going to unpack what the Bible says, what did Jesus teach, how did Jesus encounter, and then overcome the evil one. I don't think you're going to want to miss that, especially if you've ever wondered, is God really cutting deals with my life with the devil? So you may want to show back up for that series. Well, let's get back to the marriage series for now 
the marriage message is this. We find out in the end that Job's marriage survives. Wow. It survives the hard season. And then tells us this, that God restores everything that they lost, all those camel, sheep, donkeys, you know, all that. God restores it and even doubles their possessions. So from riches to rags to riches is how they end the story. It says that um, he blesses him with new sons and daughters, and the story ends on a high note, and every parent right now is thinking, you know what? (laughs) No child can ever be replaced. Each one is a unique treasure. But in this ancient story of tragedy, I think the story is trying to tell us that God can be trusted even when nothing makes sense. In fact, that's something that'd be worth us saying out loud together. Could we do that? God can be trusted. Amen. Even when nothing makes sense. That's that very time when you're asking, where is God when you really need him? Why does God seem so silent when uh, everything seems to be going wrong. When, when your friends don't understand you, they don't get you. In fact, they're trying to fix you and actually blaming you and calling you a liar at the same time. When, uh, when it feels like you're just losing things that are precious, but you can't stop them from going away. You don't know what to do. So once again, I would simply remind you that the focus of this story is not on why. This is not the kind of thing that if you get an answer, you can fill in the blank and figure it out and go, oh, I get it now. No, this is not that kind of story. This is a story about how. In the midst of all of that, how can faith survive? How can a marriage survive? Because the storms come, and they come to beat you up. Disease, crime, bankruptcy, infertility, unbelief, miscarriages, addiction, abuse, wayward children, just a few of the uh, challenges, the potential challenges that we face in a marriage. The poorer, the sickness, the sorrow, the death. So, so what? Well, so I would like to just humbly, respectfully offer you four takeaways that I'm taking away from this today for my marriage, for our future, for your marriage. Maybe there's something here for you. Uh, Number one, get wise counsel. Get wise counsel. Now, Job was open to getting wise counsel. He just didn't have wise enough friends to give it. You see that? You know, they say a word to the wise is sufficient. Well, here's a word to the wise. Find somebody wiser. <laughs> you know, I mean, get wise counsel. You need to know somebody wiser. And so I would offer to you on behalf of our church, our pastors are available, but listen, our pastors know how to make referrals to trained counselors as well who are here to help us in our relational lives, to help us in our married lives, to find wise counsel, wiser counsel. What that means is you don't have, Job, you don't have to merely listen to people who are echoing your complaints right back to you or who are trying to fix you and don't really know what they're talking about and they wind up blaming you instead. No, you don't have to live there. You can get wiser counsel. That seems to me to be a good takeaway because Job, what Job discovered after he tried to listen to his friends and it just got like, ah, noise, that he discovers that God is his best friend and God is his biggest wise counsel. Second takeaway, learn how to listen to God. (laughs) If God is the biggest friend who is bigger than all of this and your best friend who has your your life in his heart, then learning how to listen to him matters. 
How do we do that? Well, we've been spending several of the last weeks talking about how do we listen to his word? How do we reflect in scripture? How do we sense the promptings of his spirit so that we can follow them when they come? How do we how, how do others do it? So we read the story of others who have likewise gone through some challenging season and we gain wisdom from them as well. But the point here is be a learner. The word disciple means learner. So we keep learning. We learn as we go through our marriages to keep growing and, and understanding. And then as we do, then you learn wisdom to say, well, that's not, that's, that's a bubble off level. That doesn't sound that something's not right in, in that. And you're able to discern following the promptings on declaring something foolish that is not wise, that's not straight. And then you gotta watch out for those crooked voices. I mean, especially the ones in your head that say, you know, you just maybe you just need to take the edge off a little bit and self-medicate. And then, of course, discover, as many of us have, that that just leads to a whole other set of problems that aren't wise, wiser, counsel. So instead, instead of just listening to the voices in your head or getting in the echo chamber of your friends who just keep coughing back to you the stuff that you're complaining about or blaming you for it, connect with a mentor. Find a wiser counsel to connect with. Stay in your group now, if you're in one of these kind of groups, maybe you should talk to one of your pastors and let us help you out of that. But let stay connected in worship. Let worship God inhabit the praises of, as Job says, blessed be the name of the Lord. Praise to the Lord's name in the middle of his mess. Here's takeaway number three. Don't only focus on what's happening to you. Focus on who you're becoming through it. Didn't say this is easy. Just said, these are some of the takeaways I'm taking away. Our human tendency is, get me out of here. You know, where's the exit? Beam me up, Scotty. Jesus, this is the time to come back. Now, quickly, Lord. You know, that's a Bible verse. <laughs> come quickly, Lord Jesus. Get me out of this. But yet wisdom may be wanting to teach you how to go through and not just get out. Mr. and Mrs. Job go through. And in the end, find God at work, big God, with blessings beyond their circumstances. And they met God more deeply in wisdom as they went through. Do you know this? The American bison during intense weather will turn its face and face the storm. They're the only animals known to do that. They walk into the storm. Somehow they know that Turning into the storm will shorten the length of the storm. So what I'm taking away from that, he's saying like, well, when you can't get over and you can't get around and you can't get away from the storm, maybe going through it is your best, most productive option. Now, along that same line, did you know that aircraft typically take off and land into the wind? into the headwind, not with the wind at its back, but into the wind. And I, I looked this thing up and said, why? Greater safety, higher performance, increases lift. That aircraft rely on the speed of air moving against its wings to create the lift that will take it up. So then I'm thinking this, you know, get Okay, well, here it is. Sometimes what feels like it's pushing back against you is actually helping to lift you up. So here's what I'm saying, take away. Get wiser counsel. Learn how to listen to God. Don't forget that the push you're feeling actually helps to lift. Look forward to the lift that's coming, and then focus on who you're becoming through the storm, not just on getting out of it, which brings me to number four, don't give up too soon. Don't give up too soon. Churchill once said, if you're going through hell, keep going. <laughs> 
You know, you don't want to get stuck there, right? What does the scripture say? Well, Paul wrote to people like us. He said this, let's not get tired of doing what's right. For after a while, we shall reap a harvest of blessing if we don't get discouraged, if we don't give up. We trust God to be a rewarder of those who diligently, earnestly seek him. We don't stop seeking the Lord. We seek the Lord. We don't lean into our own understanding. We keep trusting him, our eyes on him. He is a rewarder of those that seek him. And then the apostle John said, this is the victory. Okay, if it's trying to beat you up, here's the victory that overcomes the world, this mess that we find ourselves in. It's our faith. So you don't lose faith. You don't give up. You keep pushing forward, especially in hard times, and especially in marriage hard times. Marriage is hard sometimes. Things don't go as you'd hoped. I mean, and I signed up for the hard stuff. I didn't hold my breath or bite my tongue when it said, you know, joy and riches and health and No. I mean, marriage is all in. And then faith is the victory that overcomes the world. You can trust God to be your fourth man in the furnace. He's bigger than your burdens. And today is the day we lay our burdens down. How do we do that? Well, you listen to his word. You just heard his word, didn't you? Did you hear the word of God today? And his spirit takes his word and then prompts our hearts to say, this one is for you. Somebody here, maybe you already know. Maybe you already know that God has tapped you out and said, no, this one's for you. I got you. I got you in my heart. I've got you on my mind. I've got you. Uh, actually, we've been wearing these little wristbands for a while and uh, reminding ourselves to pray for our families, to pray for our children, to pray for our loved ones, right? We've been doing it all through the month. And what I'd like to tell you is that God's got one of these on his wrist for you. This is what the cross means. That the scarlet bracelet around the heart of God, the hand of God, is that nail-scarred hand that bled for you. And today, this altar is the, the mercy seat where we can come to find grace and help in our time of need. And so we want to dedicate this space for a few moments here as we ask God, did your word say something for me? Is your spirit prompting something in me that is intended for me to bring into my life and my marriage, into my family, into my future. Maybe for somebody, you're in the middle of one of those hard places right now. It doesn't make sense. And you're wondering why, and it feels like God has been so silent and so absent. And yet he's saying, no, my house is a house of prayer, and today it'll be a house of blessing. We're inviting our worship response team to come right now, and we're gonna be right across the altar here as we have in each of our worship experiences today, and we are here. These are people of God, part of the body of Christ that are here for the people of God to do nothing except pray blessing for you to pray blessing for your life, to pray blessing for your relationship, to pray blessing for your marriage, to pray blessing for you beyond the hard time. And your part is simply to say, I'd like to receive a blessing. <laughs> if God has a blessing for me, today would be a good day for me to receive it. If God has a blessing for my marriage, today would be a good day for me to, to bring blessing home with me. That none of us have to leave this place with the same burdens we brought in. And it's not about, okay, who's watching? No, God is. God's got his eye on you. It's why he prompts you already, why he stirred you already. Why this could be the day that that burden, that pushback turns into lift. Why not turn into the storm? and let God shorten it and face the wind and let God lift you. So if today you don't know Jesus and the forgiveness of sins, 
by trusting him as your savior, I would like for you to pray that before we begin this opportunity of responding. Right now where you sit, Lord Jesus, forgive my sins, come into my life. I believe you died on the cross for me, rose from the dead for me, and I welcome you to be my savior. Take the throne of my life and now lead me into blessing. And if you prayed that and desire to receive the blessing, then we have it waiting for you here in person. And then I, now I want to speak to sisters and brothers, our couples, our, our families. As God has prompted you and stirred you, this is the time to say yes to the Lord. I, I will receive your guidance. I will step into wiser counsel, and I will trust you to meet me in the storm. Amen. Do you understand what I'm asking? And so what we're going to do as our worship team now comes out and prepares to start singing and leading us, um, I just want us, I'm going to stand us all up in one motion. And as we stand, I'm going to invite you to just step right on down your row and down the aisle. Yeah, let's stand together now. And they will sing. And you don't have to wait for us to start singing. If you know God has stirred your heart and you want to come and receive a blessing in prayer, just come to one of our sisters or brothers that are here for you right now as we sing. Now, this is the time. This is the moment. Amen.